Hi, everybody. Can you guys hear me okay back there? All right. Just wave at me if you can, if I start to diminish a little. Um, uh, as Pam said, um, I am a physical therapist. Um, I've been with the um, Northwestern Medical Faculty Foundation Clinic for Peripheral Neuropathy for four years or something um, like that. Time goes very fast sometimes. Um, and um, in, in our clinic, which is one of the sites that she had mentioned, um, when you come to see the physician, we have a dietitian and a social worker and a, and a physical therapist, uh, me or one of my colleagues, um, who sees you as well. And so it's just uh, from this, I have gotten a, a lot of good information from patients, with patients, you know, as we see them over the four years. Um, so my, um, my talk today, the purpose of it is to kind of um, go over some areas of physical therapy that has helped patients, um, and I'm combining information from research and from the clinic ourselves and pa patients who are coming back and, and just feedback from them as well. So hopefully you'll find something in here that is applicable to your own symptoms since we all, you know, it's such a plethora of different um, symptoms out there. And um, we'll kind of go over, all, like, the main things that we go over in the clinic, and then um, we can have questions at the end. So the most common areas that I help patients with at the clinic um, are these listed. So um, anyway, so, so general exercise program is one of the reasons. Another reason is that people come in, um, can we get to the right slide? Oh, I can do it. <laughs> Forgot. Okay. Another area are balance deficits. So people are kind of feeling on sitting on their feet. They start noticing it on the bus or the train, and then pretty soon it's just walking down the street. They start feel a little more unsteady than they usually uh, than they used to. Um, muscle weakness. A lot of times it's ankles or hands. Um, you start hearing some slapping when they're walking because their ankles aren't as strong as they used to be, or they have trouble with buttons or, or getting their earrings in or things like that. Um, another area is um, cramping or tightness of the muscle. They feel tight. They have cramping um, just kind of during the day, at night. Um, difficulties with activities of daily living or, like I said, earrings, um, bathing. They're in the shower and they go to wash their hair and um, they have to close their eyes and they, they get kind of, you know, their balance isn't the best. So activities of daily living kind of incorporate everything, but it's like, how that manifests itself in the functional everyday, day-to-day -day, um, things. And then obviously lower quality of life. You know, if, if it's hard to, to get up, it's hard to walk down the street, it's hard to bicycle when that's what you want to do, you know, like to do exercise or whatever. Um, this is, you know, can lower your quality of life. And so we see a lot of that. What can we do to help get that back up there? So, um, and I guess with the, the fine print there, it says this seminar is not, um, the purpose of it is not for me to tell like specific individualized PT prescription for for one of you, but just kind of a general. This is these are the things that we talk about with our patients, and if any of this is applicable, then you should talk to your physician and get a prescription for physical therapy. Okay, so if you do get a prescription for physical therapy or occupational therapy, the difference is um, somewhat blurry, it's like two circles with kind of a cross in the middle, but PT usually works on gross, more physical movement, walking, um, um, transferring stairs, things like that. OT, or occupational therapy, usually works on more fine motor things, um, writing, uh, bathing, um, a lot of the activities of daily living is more occupational therapy geared. So we'll, I'll kind of try to make the designation as we go through, but uh, if it's cloudy, just let me know. Um, so the evaluation, the, the therapist will test your sensation, um, pain, pressure, position. There's lots of different sensations that we have, and, and any or all of them can be affected. There's strength. It'll test the strength. Um, Strength, just um, static strength, just how hard can you hold this second. Also endurance strength, which can be completely different. Um, function, I'll talk about um, how, like your activities of daily living, what kinds of things are you having trouble doing? Uh, even if it's just standing up or stairs. Uh, balance testing. And then an important thing is goals. Like what, what about this is the most troubling to you and kind of prioritize what the things you wanna work on are. 
Um, and again, the, I just want to reinforce that this is, it's ideal to go in and have a specific individual evaluation done to give a really good individual program. Okay, so the first area, I'm going to go through those most common areas and kind of step by step. Just a quick thing, how mm -hmm. long does that initial evaluation take? It's usually about an hour. In the clinic, I don't have an hour to see all the patients, but like in the clinic when, when we just have a, a consult, it's about 20 minutes. But if you go get a, a PT prescription, the evaluation is about an hour. Okay, so the first item was how, why should I start an exercise program? And I get this all the time. I mean, you know, there aren't that many of us who are actively in exercise programs, um, but it is a really, really important part. Um, our bodies are not made to sit um, and watch TV or be on the computer all day. We're, you know, we're made to, to be up and walk and, and um, it's helpful for every system of your body to exercise, not just your nerves. So why have a, a, an exercise program? Um, well, the first is exercise program does decrease the number of cancer treatment related toxicities. It does help, you know, it helps your body, it helps the blood pumping, it helps clean the blood, it keeps everything as healthy as possible. It keeps your nerves oxygenated, keeps them healthy, it gets new, nutrients throughout the whole body. It maximizes function, it keeps you strong, keeps your endurance up, and enhances the quality of life. I, there are so many patients that we've had come through the clinic who have been more sedentary and it somehow I've convinced them to get out and get um, a regular exercise program and they have felt much better. Uh, and and they, will, they, won't, they won't want to stop. And there is support out there, uh, research support for um, exercise with peripheral neuropathy. Um, it is shown to um, attenuate the onset, prevent the onset of some types of, of peripheral neuropathy, especially diabetic peripheral neuropathy because of the, the role that the sugars can have. Um, but it does help keep the nerves as healthy as possible and attenuate the loss. Um, strength improves following resistance exercises with um, hereditary motor and sensory neuropathies. And there is a local effect on peripheral nerves, like I just talked about. It increases the oxygen to the nerves, increases the nutrients to the nerves, and can help. And also, can exercise help with pain? And the answer is yes. There is, there is um, data to show that it's called um, exercise-induced hypalgesia. So it's, it's pain relief that comes naturally with your body after exercise. Yeah, I, um, I exercise very modestly. I do water walking. Cool. Mm -hmm. The only problem is, after even a modest amount of exercise, the pain is intolerable the rest of the, uh, especially in the evening, and the cost-benefit analysis—I mean, ratio—is I don't seem to get much out of the, the water walking, but they cut a lot of pain, and um, I don't know how to balance. Yeah, um, there is definitely, um, when, when you have pain that increases when you're weight bearing or when you're, when you're putting weight through your feet, which is very common, it, there is kind of a barrier to exercise. That doesn't mean that you can't do it. Uh, everyone is different, again, like we've talked about. Um, a lot of people, even if they have the pain, overall, their pain is less even when they are exercising. So the, the exercise may increase the pain than before the exercise, but overall their pain is less. So you kind of have to monitor yourself. Another thing, if, if it's potentially the bottom of the pool that gives you trouble, um, if you wear aqua socks or something on your feet so they don't, they don't touch, you know, sometimes it's that hypersensitivity, they don't touch the bottom of the pool, you may have, have less pain. Or somehow um, make yourself more buoyant if you have um, something that, that helps lift some of the weight off your feet. Um, you would have, you would still be exercising, but you wouldn't have as much weight on your feet and have less friction. Does that make sense? No, I, I, I hadn't thought of it that way, but uh, I'll give it a try. <laughs> I also find that it seems like my muscles are atrophying, uh, and uh, I don't know where to take it next. Yeah, and you know, part of that it comes along with neuropathy. When you're losing strength, you're losing muscle mass, and that's what you see. You can visually see um, atrophy. Um, and I think that, you know, that would be appropriate that you could talk to your physician and see if you can get a, a PT evaluation, see what your strength is like, see where the areas that you could use maybe some more specific strengthening to. 
Yes. Uh, another option is to be not weight bearing and just uh, do it on an exercise bike. Um, you probably a lot of these people are are, are not conditioned, and uh, you would do better probably like in a modern situation like on a recumbent exercise bike. That's another option. I, I go through some of these non-weight bearing options a little bit later, but yeah, stationary bike and pool are the two, are, are two of the most common ways of doing that. Um, swimming, obviously, you don't have the weight wearing on your feet, but if you are walking, um, those are some of the suggestions that we have in the stationary bike. Thank you. Okay. Um, so anyway, so uh, we're talking about uh, we're talking about pain with exercise. So acute exercise again shown to to um, decrease pain perception and um, exercise aerobic um, intensities around 60 or 70 percent of your heart rate have been shown to produce this and which just sounds like kind of a vague number and I'll talk a little bit later about how you can monitor your heart rate without you know getting the old calculator out and, and uh, doing things that are kind of hard to do when you're, you're exercising. And the other question is can I exercise with can, um, cancer induced peripheral neuropathy? And this kind of goes back to what Pam was saying. There are, there's not a lot of research out there in peripheral neuropathy in general. But um, when I've talked to the physicians and when I've looked at the, the literature that's out there, low to moderate intensity exercise has helped um, with across the spectrum of people with neuropathy. And there's no reason that patients with cancer with cancer induced peripheral neuropathy shouldn't exercise. And then the next question, you know obviously is what should I do? Like if you want me to exercise, what should I do to exercise? And you have some options. There's strength training, and but remember when you're strength training, it, you have to have a minimum of 12 weeks to show um, strength gains, which is can be kind of frustrating to people. But um, the good news is once you've been through 12 weeks, you're in a habit, you're in a routine, and then you'll start seeing some strength gains. Aerobic training, um, low impact training, um, include, increases cardiovascular performance, increases pain tolerance, decreases fatigue, and decreases depression. Um, I will say you want to watch, make sure you're not getting over, uh, over exercising your muscles, which again is not something that most of us have to worry about, it's more just getting out the door. Um, but if you have muscle weakness, severe weakness within 30 minutes of completion, or if you have excessive soreness between 24 and 48 hours, you may have overdone it somewhat. And just general tips that I give in the clinic for people uh, when they say, oh, what should I do? There's biking and walking. And my advice is just do what you like to do or what you will do. Anything is better than nothing. And that's kind of the first tip that I give people. Monitor your heart rate the easy way, which means just be able to speak in phrases, not sentences or words. So if I'm out running with Pam and I can talk to her like I'm talking to you guys, I'm probably not working hard enough. But if I could only spit out a word here and there, then I'm working too hard. So if you can speak in phrases while you're working out, then you know you're in a pretty good um, target heart rate area. And also, if you can think to yourself, reason, you know, being reasonable, I am working moderately hard. Just those words correspond very well to target heart rates. And if you look at um, rates of perceived exertion. Another great way to get exercising is to get a workout buddy. If someone is waiting for you at the corner, it's much more likely that you'll get out and go and, and get out and go exercise. Set a routine. If you're used to getting up at six on Tuesdays and Thursdays and going for a walk, pretty soon you'll miss it and you'll and you you'll know it feels better and you'll it's that's just what you do at six o'clock on Tuesday and Thursday morning. Some people like to do the exact same thing. They like predictability. Um, a lot of other people like to mix it up a little bit. So walking one day. Um, yoga is a, is a really great way to incorporate balance, strengthening, and stretching. If that, and there's a lot of good restorative yoga classes. Um, there's a multitude of things out there to check out with that. Um, strengthening and also stretching. And this is what we were talking about a little bit earlier. If you have pain with weight bearing, if you have pain with your, when you're putting weight through your feet, a pool, stationary bike, and also sometimes yoga can help um, patients with that. We've seen that in the clinic quite a bit. Okay, so the next major question is, 
How can I improve my balance deficits? Does it, how, how many people here have some balance problems that they notice? <coughs> it's very, very common. So when it, to, to balance properly, you use three different areas. You use your inner ear, you use the information you get from your feet, and you use your eyesight. So if you're getting information from your feet that isn't normal or isn't correct, you're also you're losing a big part of what you need to, to balance perfectly. And you really have to rely on your inner ear and your eyesight as well. Balance strategies. This is my daughter on her way down at the pumpkin patch. She did not get hurt, and I did not try to make her fall for this. It was just, <laughs> it just happened. Um, but I use this to talk about balance strategies. So um, in order to stop yourself from falling when you feel a perturbation, the first thing you do is you use your ankle to try to balance yourself. With a lot of people with peripheral neuropathy, your ankle is weak. And so your first line of defense is already a little bit um, um, diminished. The second, the second um, strategy is you use your hip. So you try to you know, kind of catch yourself with your hip, something a little bit larger. And when that doesn't work, then you step. So, um, so that, and those are kind of the, 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 three, the three physical ways you have of maintaining your balance. Now, if you're using something to hold on to, if you're using a walker or a cane or something like that, then the arm goes first. The first thing you do is grab with your arms, and then you do the ankle and hip, and then you step. So when we talk about doing balance exercises, I always um, encourage people not to hold on while we're, they're doing them because it changes your balance strategy. So evaluation, if you get evaluated for your balance, first they'll talk about, you, you'll, talk, you'll comment on your balance. When do you notice that your balance is off? It's just a mild deficit or is, are you falling? You know, falling is a big um, uh, red sign in, in my mind when someone, a patient tells me that they're falling. I, I've, that's, I'll say you need a prescription for outpatient therapy because, you know, obviously falling can cause all kinds of a myriad of other issues. So that's one thing I always say. Um, I had the physician will write a prescription for outpatient PT. That you'll get evaluated for your static ba balance or like how, how well can you hold a position, like standing upright, do you have problems? Um, and I'll show you some of these, these um, exercises in a little bit and this will become maybe a little more clear. And then dynamic balance, so balance while you're walking. It's a, it's, some people have much better static than dynamic and vice versa. And then functional balance, so this is um, balance on the, the train, on the bus, um, walking down the street, things like that. In the, in the, in some people will test great in the clinic, but they'll walk down the street and there's taxis honking and there's people wishing by them and it's a whole different story. <coughs> so um, during the evaluation process, and, and this is also part of the exercise program that I'll, I'll give to a lot of patients, I'll have them put their feet in different positions in order to give their body different balance challenges. So the top there is um, shoulder width stance. So their feet, the feet are shoulder width apart and that is the most stable of, of all the positions. And then it's a continuum down. The next would be putting their feet right next to each other. The third is one foot kind of in front of the other but staggered. The fourth is one foot right in front of, us, of the other like tandem stance. The fifth is standing on foam, or in therapy sessions, sometimes they have these gel um, pieces that they'll have patients stand on. And then the sixth is single leg stance. We, um, it's hard to see on there, but just standing on one foot. So that's the continuum. And patients that come in fall everywhere on that continuum. Everyone kind of has a different spot. So when I think about prescribing exercise programs or when people try to um, advance their own programs at home, they just kind of slide down this um, depending on where they are. So for example, one of the, um, and these are just examples that I'll kind of throw out to you, some of the common ones that, that we give out in the clinic. Static stance. So I try to get people to, to really work on holding a position. This particular um, exercise, the picture, has the person in the number six position or, or staying on one foot, which is the most difficult. But this can, can be done in any of those positions. You can put your feet together. You could be in tandem stance, so one foot directly in front of the other. And we're just trying to hold a position for as long as possible. 
So we usually do this exercise in two ways. One, that you can hold for like 30 seconds so you can try to progress that up to a minute. And then something that's even a little bit harder just to work on so that you can hold the hold for five or 10 seconds. So you're really trying to kind of um, hold more difficult poses and more just endurance static poses. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes? Uh, someone told me that if you keep your tongue up uh, on the top of your alec, that it helps. Maybe you're concentrating. It helps you to concentrate. I don't know. I've never heard that before. I know that's how you get rid of brain freeze. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. I've never heard that well, I know in yoga they tell you to stare at something yeah. when you're doing that. Yeah. And it, really it helps, helps a lot. Yeah, it helps a lot. What helps did you say? To, to stare, stare at yeah. Some yeah. one yeah, thing, yeah. but not another person. Cause yeah, because they, yeah, cause they wobble. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, and so, and, and then uh, my next exercise uh, usually for patients is to try to transition to a more dynamic balance situation. So this would be a weight shift, for example. So you're shifting your center of gravity over top of your base of support. And again, this picture, um, the, the person's feet is very far apart. But you could do this even on one foot if you wanted to and try to bring your center of gravity forward and backward and side mm -hmm. to side. Um, and any of those positions that are in the... This a couple slides before this. Oops, wrong way. Um, a squat exercise is helpful for for lots of different people. It's a good balance exercise. It's a good strengthening exercise, and it's a good functional exercise. A lot of people who have balance problems also have problems getting up and uh, and out of a chair. And so this squat exercise is um, if you stand with shoulder width apart, you stand right in front of a chair. So that if you do lose your balance, you just sit down. There's no danger. Um, you bend your hips and your knees, and you keep your, you stick your backside out toward the chair, just like you're going to sit down, and then you stand back up. So it looks like this. Here I'm standing. I squat down toward the chair, and then stand back up. And if I fall, I just get to sit in the chair. So it's it's uh, it's safe. And it's a really good. It's really good for your backside. It's good for your your um, quad muscles, your thigh muscles, and it's good for balance because you're shifting your center of gravity back and forward. And then there's more dynamic balance exercises that that I have: walking on your toes, walking on your heels, and then <laughs> getting some faces, um, and then also walking heel to toe or on a on a straight line. And those are some more dynamic exercises. Um, tips that I give people, it, do exercises, the balance exercises within the reach of a stable surface or find a hallway. If you have a hallway, it's easy to do them at, without holding on. You feel a little more comfortable because you can, you know, put your hand out either way if you need to. Try not to hold on to anything. Again, that changes your balance strategy and doesn't put your feet first. Um, pick exercises that are challenging. It doesn't help you if it's not hard to do, which, you know, is kind of true for lots of things. Um, perform them daily. Uh, Some people, I don't have time to do it. I said, well, when you're brushing your teeth, put your feet in a position that's challenging to do, or you know, something that you have to do. Try, try to multitask with it. Or if you you talk to your daughter on the phone every day, you know, do your exercises while you're talking on the phone. Common variations to make them easier or harder. Um, eyes open or closed. Remember the triad of things: the sensation, the inner ear, and the eyesight. If something's too easy for you. And then if you close your eyes, you maybe you can't quite stick to the next level, but if you close your eyes, that will help. Um, shoes on or off. And then also the firmness of the floor. If the floor is more mushy, then it's going to be harder to balance. If it's nice and firm, it's easier to balance. And if, uh, some people are, don't have problems with their balance, but do have problems with sensation and are kind of worried about this progressing. Uh, Yoga, dance, aerobics, anything where you're actively working on your balance on a regular basis um, can be helpful to attenuate any loss or, if, or at least have you recognize it really early. Uh, okay, the next area is muscle weakness. Um, again, most of the, the people come in, they have weakness in their feet, their ankles, their fingers, and hands. Um, and then it can kind of progress uh, toward the, the trunk. During the evaluation, you can get manual muscle testing, which is just 
um, you put your arm in a position and they'll say, will you hold it? And someone will push down on you. And then they, because of how much resistance you can give, you get kind of a, a graded score. You can do individual muscles can be tested, groups of muscles can be tested. There's also more functional strength testing. Like I said, in, there's in, an endurance component as well. Um, there's a specific muscle test, or if, you, if I can test you and say, uh, I want you to stand up and walk for 10 feet. I can look at someone when they stand up and see kind of where are they weak. Um, what, can, what kinds of things can we work on just on a functional level? And then endurance testing. So some, uh, some of the most common exercises that I give patients for um, strengthening is um, ankle plantar flexion, which is if you have weakness in the back of your, of your um, calves, and that would be like raising up on your toes. Um, more commonly, I have patients that have weakness in the front of their calves, and so I have patients um, tap their toes, and it's easier if they're sitting, so if they're really weak, I'll start them in sitting, have them tap their toes, and then stand up and do it, because it's much more difficult when you're in standing. Walking on heels, walking on toes. So there are a lot of exercises that can incorporate both balance and strengthening, which is good, um, you don't want to overwhelm yourself with exercises, a number of exercises, so there's a lot of crosstalk. Um, some patients have problems just with ankle stability. They feel like their ankles roll, and so I can give them exercises where they move their, their ankles out to the side, like ankle eversion or inversion coming in the other direction. Uh, also, it sim things as simple as making an alphabet with your ankle. So if you point your toe and draw the, the alphabet, you make your, your ankle go in every single direction that it can go. The ankle has so many different directions, and it's important to work on all the different directions for good stability. Again, uh, so this is um, knee and hip, the squat we already talked about. This is a very popular one because of the multifactorial exercise that it is. Hip extension, if there's some hip weakness, especially in the backside and hip flexion or marching. Here's another hip extension exercise um, with the knee bent. And all of these are, more, are very specific to different patients. I'm just kind of giving some general guidelines. Or if the patients have problems with their wrists. And wrists and hands, again, are more of an occupational therapy. So if you're, if you're more, um, if you have trouble with your fingers and your wrists and your hands, your physician will usually recommend Occupational therapy or physical therapy. So anyway, wrist extension, wrist deviation, because the wrist is a lot kind of like the ankle, right? So the wrist goes as many different directions as the ankle goes. So you want to work in all the different directions and not just your, your planar ones. All our deviations. Um, fingers, uh, abducting the fingers, squeezing them together. You can do it in putty. You can do it in Play-Doh to try to get some resistance. Um, there's all kinds of things that you can find on the internet for everything. But in particular, for finger strengthening, you can do bands. It's harder. It's not like you have a little finger weight. So you have to try to be creative. And you can do it with Play-Doh or putty where you put your finger and you spread it apart. Um, there are, like I said, there's bands for this too. Occupational therapy would help with this. But okay. All right, and then muscle cramps and tightness. We have a lot of muscle cramps. Um, tight muscles are more prone to cramping. So when, when someone that comes in and says, oh, I'm having these, these calf cramps or, or um, quad cramps, we just try to, try to get them on a regular stretching um, exercise program. You need to stretch a muscle at least 30 seconds to get the muscle shape to change at all. So 30 seconds to a minute of holding the stretch. Um, some of the most common ones are a calf stretch. Yes? Uh, when you stretch, is that 30 seconds to a minute only once? Or is that multiple it, times? You, can, you, can, you, have to do, you have to hold it for at least 30 to 60 seconds once. If it's a tight muscle, I'll have patients do it three or five times. Once it starts to, a, a day, once it starts to loosen up, then, it's, then you can kind of back on how, how many times you do it, but you still need to hold at least 30 seconds. Especially if someone has like calf cramps, for example. 
Um, you don't want to wait till it cramps to stretch it, although that does help get the cramp away. But you want to get in a regular, you know, you get up, you need to warm up your muscle first. You wouldn't pop out of bed and stretch it because that's not so fun. But if you walk around a little bit, stretch it. So stretch it after breakfast, stretch it after lunch, um, kind of get in your routine. And that has helped um, patients decrease the amount of cramps. Not everybody, but it has helped. Does that answer your question? Yep. Yeah. Well, that, yeah, that's it. That, that muscle's already warmed up. You don't have to worry about warming that muscle up. Yes. Get up and stretch. Yeah, get up and stretch. Mm -hmm. What about foot and toe cramps? Foot and toe cramps, um, it's, you have to take the, the foot, kind of flex it over your, this is going to be attractive, um, <laughs> flex it over your knee and then just, because I assume it's in the ball of your foot. And you stretch your toes out, extend your toes out over, and try to keep your your um, your ankle bent as well. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. And you just want to try to hold that again for 30 seconds. The same thing for the whole sole of the foot. Yeah. Okay. You mean like if you have cramping in the ball of your foot right no, here? No, the whole the whole bottom of the yes, foot. Yes. Yes. You just have to stretch it out. Hold it for 30 seconds. See, that doesn't work for me. Usually, if it's really bad, I just stand up, and that seems to But then that's, that's what you're doing. You probably, but if you stand up on it, you're putting more weight than you can with your, with your hands. Yeah, but it, the hands don't work. I don't know. It's just weird. No, that, then that's fine. Because, like, this, this person here, he could, um, with, he's putting more weight through his foot by standing mm -hmm. on it than he, than he probably could by pushing right. on it with his hand. Oh, okay. But sometimes, if it's in the middle of the foot, it just needs to be you. It just needs to be kind of manipulated with your hands, and you sometimes just like rubbing it out if it's like totally cramping up. <coughs> yes, you were first. Okay, so last year my friend told me put a bar of soap between the sheets, and you won't get any leg cramps. And I thought, okay, this someone's crazy, but I'm gonna do it anyway. I haven't had a leg cramp in a year. And I sleep with a bar of soap between What the brand? Every night. <laughs> <laughs> do. Does it matter what brand? I, I just use, I love Irish Spring. That's the soap I use, so I just put it in between the sheets. I, I haven't had a muscle cramp in a year. So maybe it's a little bit Yeah, maybe. Maybe it's, a, yeah, it's calming you or something. No, no, uh, I put it between the sheets. Mm -hmm. Like by the calf. Yeah. And I sleep with a bar of soap between the sheets. Kind of stood up the laundry because she accidentally left the bar of soap in the sheets when she washed them. <laughs> <laughs> and the washing machine. Well, that was fortuitous. It. But it, it really does work. You guys yeah. should try because it it's a real easy thing to do. If it works, if it works for you, not, email <laughs> Pam and Brenda and let us all know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm wrapped. Yeah. It's just a bar of soap. I. I Unwrap. Yeah, unwrap. Sure can't hurt. I get a swelling in the hand. Uh, or neuropathy. Uh huh. Okay. In the morning? Is it happening in the morning? The most? Frequently. It happens frequently. Um, I mean, they could be swelling could be caused by many different things. I mean, if you don't have the muscles pumping the fluid back, um, it could be weakness, it could be inactivity of your hand. Um, or it could be a plethora of other, of other things. But it's something that you know, maybe could be addressed with occupational therapy. Talk to the physician. Yes? The podium was in the way when you were doing your demonstration. So could you? Yes. Oh, of the foot? Oh, sure, yes. sure, sure. So, so uh, well, we kind of had two different ways, but. I'll take either one. OK. <laughs> well, if, if your foot is cramping, uh -huh. you just grab your toes and oh. extend them. And then with the other hand, you can just rub in there if you need to. Um, alternatively, you can do the, like the runner stretch and stretch out your foot like this way too. I like the first two better. It, it depends on, try both. You never know. I still sure can't see your first one. So the first way, okay. <laughs> Everyone, I should have got my, so. So if, you, if you're sitting down, you put your foot over your, your leg, extend your toes with your hand, and then you can always rub in your foot with the heel of your other hand. Just kind of stretch, you're just, you're just stretching that muscle that's inside your thick ball of your foot. Does that make sense? Yeah. 
Anybody else need any more? <laughs> go over to the other I'm balancing. I'm doing a balancing. I was going to say you're doing I can like add that to my list. Like, well, yeah. I wondered if there's been any studies about acupuncture and whether it benefits the community. You know, there hasn't. In, um, I think it's, be, you know, some things work for some people and some things don't work for others. So if you have, even, even if it works for 70% of the people and not 30% of the people, it's still not going to come out statistically significant. So um, I, I've never heard of it hurting. I've heard of it not helping. Um, but I, I, I can't judge that. And we've heard that it does help for some people. And there is some studies that are being done at St. Louis University with uh, acupuncture and folks with peripheral neuropathy. And as Vicki said, some people it works, some people it doesn't. So there's nothing scientifically proven that it does work, but there is some studies being done. Um, just give it a try. It's always you know, the best you can do. I'd like to speak to that. Mm -hmm. um, when, his, when my son's uh, neuropathy picked up, um, and in the peds world, they don't know this as well as the adults, and so we didn't have the kind of assistance we needed. So we sought the help of a chiropractor who did acupressure, not acupuncture, mm -hmm. and frankly, it got him walking. And it, you know, he was in pain and awful situation for two to three weeks, uh, but it got him down the stairs. He was a prisoner in the upstairs for weeks. Mm -hmm. So I yeah. recommend acupressure, mm -hmm. especially for people who don't like those ones. Yeah, <laughs> legit. Yes? Oh, well, so far you've been discussing uh, neuropathy uh, sort of by itself. What happens when it's impacted by arthritis, spinal stenosis, multiple hip replacement? Sure. Uh, I mean, it just makes it healthy. more complicated, you know. Um, I mean, you're still going to have balance issues. Um, you may have different strength um, issues than, than, you know, just pure, but who has, who, who only has one thing, you know? I mean, that's, uh, everybody's got, you know, more than one thing. So, um, so I mean, it, it, you know, might even you might even be a, a better candidate for physical therapy or occupational therapy. I have one question. Um, you know, those they're running shoes actually, but they um, you your toes. Like, oh, the toe wider, ones. And yeah. And they also have the socks. A lot of us um, in yoga that come here we we use oh, the okay. socks more mm -hmm. than the thing but at home when i exercise i friends of mine bought me those shoes mm -hmm. and i can't tell you what a difference it made mm -hmm. it was huge so what are your thoughts on that as far as the spreading of the toes and stuff i mean you, you whatever whatever works i mean i have a, a patient who couldn't love to read couldn't touch the the pages it was just too sensitive and so um, he w put a glove on, and, and he used a glove with that, that had grippy, you know, like a lot of the running gloves have like some grippies on them, and now he reads. You know, he just he took a pair of gloves. Um, and this is something we'll kind of talk about later, but just um, there, we have a support group that I'll show, you know, I'll talk about later, but just having communication like that, having a group of people where you can say, oh, I had that, and I put a bar of soap under my sheet, or, <laughs> you know, I mean. It's going to work. <laughs> but you know, or I have aqua socks and they work great and then and then someone else tries the aqua socks in the pool and it helps them or I mean it just that's what I'm talking about quality of life. Maybe I can't take your pain away, but maybe I can give you a suggestion that that can help and then you can read again. Well, I just wondered like the spreading of the toes is, is It might be cuz cuz they're no. No. But maybe because your toes aren't touching, and so they're not, you know, that whatever material that is, is easier on your neuropathy than the toes together. Or, I mean, just, or puts your foot in a position that's easier for, I mean, that's why sometimes you just need to try all different things, because there is so different with every single person. No, I must say, it, exercise is huge. Yep. When I was exercising <laughs> regularly, I have no pain. Mm -hmm. It really is. And some people swear on Crocs. Crocs saved their life. You know, like there's, mm -hmm. everyone's got something, yeah. you know, a little different, but if it helps one other person, fantastic. Okay, let's keep going. Um, hamstrings is another thing that people um, have some cramping with. Um, this is one uh, hamstring stretch. It's a little easier to do than, the, than the, your runner stretch, um, if you remember from track, like 
people are doing. Um, <coughs> if you put your heel up on a step, I'll use this chair, and lean forward. So I'm not leaning forward like this. I'm not stretching my back out. I'm keeping my back straight and just leaning forward, and you can feel your hamstring stretching. That's the easiest way to stretch that, uh, especially in the middle of the night. Um, you can also do the hamstring stretch like this, as you may be more familiar with. This, um, but again, if leaning forward, he's not leaning all the way forward. He's not stretching out his back. He's keeping his back straight and leaning, like you're bringing your chin toward your leg, not your head, not the top of your head. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Excellent. Uh, finger extension. Now, this is kind of like what we're talking with the toe, but this finger. So if people get cramps sometimes in the palm of their hands, you can stretch. And this is what you're doing with your toes when we were talking about doing your toes. Uh, finger flexion stretches, um, wrist extension stretches, if, they, if you get any cramping in your um, forearms, um, and the chest stretch, which is just good for everybody. Okay. Okay, and then um, activities of daily living. How, what can make it easier for me to take a shower? What can make it easier to put my socks on or my shoes on or my earrings on or getting my hair done in the morning so it doesn't, I don't spend 50% of my energy just blow drying my hair and then have to leave exhausted, things like that. There are lots of different um, um, techniques, you know, like just, I mean, just as simple as sitting down to, get your, to put your uh, makeup on or brush your hair or brush your teeth, um, just to conserve that little bit of energy so that you can use it in a different way later. Um, but there's also a ton of different equipment which would be, which we could, um, occupational therapy helps with a ton. Um, and you can go the Salmons and Preston catalog and look at all kinds of stuff on the internet too. But just some suggestions, um, laces that stretch so you don't have to tie them. Um, and you really can't tell by looking at them. Um, longer, you know, heel uh, slides. You can get, if you can't zip or button with your fingers, if it's difficult, there's hooks that you could zip with the hooks or the button with the other side. Um, uh, bras that don't fasten, that you could slip on without having to try to fasten it behind your back with delicate little delicate fingers. Um, this hair dryer stand has saved lots of people, and, and it becomes a very popular piece of equipment in the whole household, um, just to help out with, with blow drying your hair. Long-handled um, brushes. Electric toothbrushes um, can help a ton. Um, anything, any pumps, pumps for your shampoo, pumps for your conditioner, pumps for uh, any kind of soap that you have in the house. Um, bath benches, if you feel like you might fall over in the shower, you, you need a seat for the shower so you don't fall over. Um, there's a multitude of different kinds of seats out there for showers, tubs, whatever. Um, and then walking aids, uh, I, I have kind of two populations of patients in the clinic when it comes to walking aids. There's the people who will not do it if their life depended on it, and the people who are glad for a little bit of help so they can get out and do stuff. Mm -hmm. um, not sure where all of you guys are, but uh, we've had um, enormous um, feedback with the rollator, which is the, these pictures here um, on the top and the side. The rollator... I don't know if it, I'm sure you guys maybe have seen them. They have lots of different features. They've got uh, they've got baskets. They've got foot pedals, like the top picture, so you could it can turn into a chair. I have a patient who wanted to go to the museum with his kids, um, but he couldn't. He didn't have the stamina, so he got the rollator. Uh, he was able to walk through parts of the museum when he got tired. He sat down. They put the foot plates on, and his kids would push him the rest of the way. So. He was on, the, he was on the, the line of people who were just wanted something that would help. Um, and, but, you know, the, the back flips on, the foot pedals flip down. It's really easy to do. The other good thing about it, it does have brakes on it, so you can brake it and sit down if you need to, even if you're just waiting for the bus or whatever. Um, so it obviously has a lot more... Uh, a, a lot more advantage over the, just the standard rolling water, walker. And it does fold, it doesn't get as small, and it's not covered by insurance typically, um, whereas the other one is. 
Um, there's canes. If you go online, you can find the fanciest canes out there. Um, if like the you know the standard cane is, you know, not something that you know, you know, for any reason you want a black one, or if you want um, diamond studded canes, you can find them out there if that's what you want. Just make sure that it's fitted properly to you um, before you order one. Any advantage to the four prong over a single? It's all about stability. The four prong cane is a little bit more stable than the single tip cane. Um, house cleaning, you know, there's, there's the house cleaning, um, the automatic shower house cleaning things that just kind of spray your shower for you when you're out. Anything that sprays um, or is electric, it helps with cleaning. <laughs> Meal prep, there's a diff bunch of different gadgets. Thicker handles are helpful. Um, Anything that it's electric, the OXO, those OXO products, uh, those have been really great for people just because it's a bigger, a bigger handle, so it's easier for them to, for people to grip if they have weakness in their hands. And then, how do I improve my quality of life? Which you know is a difficult question to answer. Um, but from the PT perspective, these are my answers: energy conservation. Try to conserve energy. Um, in the day-to-day -day things, such as sitting down when you brush your teeth or comb your hair, so that you can have a little bit more energy to go on a walk with your friend, um, or, or go to the museum, or, or go to work, or whatever kind of keeps you going. Uh, find a way to get out and do the things that you like to do, such as my example with the, um, the patient that really wanted to go to the museum. He found a way to get it done, and, and it completely changed it, changed how he felt. Regular exercise decreases the amount of depression, increase, decreases pain, increases, um, um, I mean, from top to bottom, it helps your body for health-wise. I mean, you, there's not a thing out there that um, doesn't help with exercise. Use an assistive device if, if you need to, and try, to, try as hard as you can to get away from the stereotypes of the stigma, because if it helps you get out and helps you do the things that you want to do, you will be happier and it won't matter. You have a question? Yeah. Um, can utilizing aspects of the artist like painting, clay, or crafts also help reduce symptoms of cancer? I'm sorry. Can you say that again? Can like re using um, aspects of like the arts, like painting, oh, clay, yes. and crafts help mm -hmm. reduce symptoms? Of I mean, and yeah. I mean, anything. I mean, help with the symptoms or just quality of life? Oh, well, kind of it all, huh? Well, the clay putty, you can do exercise with the, the clay putty. And it, it, anytime you're like working with your hands, it includes, increases the strength, you know. So anything like that could help. Um, also, just a support group, like, like here, just listening to other people's ideas and, hear, and hearing how they deal with uh, their symptoms, which might be similar to you. And obviously, individualized counseling as well. Do you have a question? Pain or weakness to, oh, yeah, uh huh? I thought, oh, I must have restless leg syndrome because it was constant, like mm -hmm. jumping. Mm -hmm. Is that possibly not restless leg syndrome? Um, you'd have to find out through the diagnostic test, of that, and that's why they do the test to try to figure out is it something restless leg, is it peripheral neuropathy? Um, I, think what, I think what I was referring to is that a lot of times the weakness or pain starts in the toes and slowly works up, not necessarily on a daily fashion, but, you know, over time. So I think that's what I was referring to. Um, we do have a support group, a peripheral neuropathy support group um, at downtown at the Northwestern Medical Faculty Foundation. Um, and they meet on the third Friday of each month. Um, all the information, the contact information is there in the sheet. I know it's downtown, um, but uh, if I, th um, I think that Julian, Julian is our a social worker at the clinic, and he has, you know, a regular set of people that come, and, and it's, been, it's been really great for the people who, who come. They have, depending on what the group wants, they've had a dietitian come talk to them, they've had uh, Tai Chi one time, and so um, it's, it, just, it was a, a great resource for the people who are able to come down, down there, downtown. Excuse me. Yes? Uh, do you guys set up any kind of conference for there has been talk of that. Um, I don't know what the current status of that is. I don't know if Pam's. Yeah, we tried to um, 
we're working on it. There's no equipment in the room that we can set up to do video conferencing or anything like that at this point. But we're so just even a regular uh, Skype. Conference. Skype, yeah. 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 We're working on it. Okay. Um, but keep on Julian at Julian Breslow. <laughs> All the contact information is there, and so um, and he's very open to suggestion. He's very, he's he's wonderful. Okay, I know we've talked a lot about, we've answered some questions throughout the seminar. Is there anything else that anyone wants to add? Suggestions for other people, not only just questions? Yes? I've never heard of stone payment. I think it's called an anodyne treatment or something. Anodyne treatment. I have heard of that. think about that? Do you do that at the clinic? Is that one of the things you do? We don't. Um, the research out there, so, you know, it's not statistically significant that it works. But again, I've had people come in and say that it works for them. Other people say it doesn't work for them. What is it? What is it? It's like this hot, um, it's like a hot. Uh, it's infrared treatment. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. It's infrared. Yeah. And actually, after several treatments, your symptoms increase, but then supposedly are supposed to go away. And you know, I, I, haven't, I haven't talked to anyone. No one's ever really given me a lot of uh, you know, details about their treatments there. So we, we don't do it there. No, because we don't have it. We, we talked about getting one, but then the, you know, it, it's hard to buy one if the, you know, the research isn't you know, necessarily sure, supporting that it for everyone. The treatment is usually used for uh, diabetic peripheral neuropathy patients yeah. to help the blood flow, and it's just temporary. So it's a temporary relief, uh, and then it goes back. So. You know, again, we're not saying don't try it. If you want to try it, try it because it may work, but it's going to be uh, a temporary relief. Really. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I do. Do anything to assess who should be driving with neuropathy? Yeah, I mean, that's a that's a really good question. I know that um, the Rehab Institute of Chicago has worked paired with people to do um, testing for driving. Um, we don't do that at the clinic, but that comes up often. People can't feel their feet. Um, and that, that does come up a lot. And it's a very, very good area to address. Yes, in the back. Um, Lexington Brothers has when they do um, assessments of people for driving. Okay. And um, I've had uh, uh, physical therapy for balance years ago over at Lutheran in Genoa. Mm -hmm. No, uh, I mean, physical therapy is going to address, like, the, the points that I have here. It's going to address your balance. A lot of different diagnosis has problems with balance. It's going to address strength. A lot of people have different, you know, problems with strength. So um, I think that uh, there's a lot of different um, environments that you can do PT. Um, e I've suggested a lot to a lot of patients even going to an outpatient ortho clinic if they're not feeling challenged where they are because they do agility training with like athletes and things and that's balance is agility training it's just depending on what level you know you're at so I think there's lots of different environments you have to find the right environment you know for you yeah I'm taking the driving test twice and I use both feet for driving one price for the gas the oh yeah excellent <laughs> well I applaud you for taking the driving test with it Pardon? I applaud you for taking the driving test with it Yes. I was going to say, my, my dad was losing feeling in his feet, and um, he had a handbrake mm -hmm. put onto the car. And it's for under $100, any car dealer can do it. Mm -hmm. It's just a, a mechanism, and mm -hmm. uh, it's a handbrake. And yeah. he got to be pretty good with it. I mean, there's all kinds of adaptations that you can have uh, make for your vehicle. I mean, patients that, you know, spinal cord injury patients, you know, who have very high level injuries are able to drive. I mean, there's lots of, you can use with your hands. There's there's lots of different things that you can do, for sure. Yes? You had talked about the foundation's mission around registering in patient education and research. What about clinician education? We're doing that, too, because okay. that's important. There's a lack of understanding of, of what this uh, disease is, how to diagnose it, and how to treat it effectively. Mm -hmm. So most people that usually start feeling pain, or let's say, in their feet, usually typically go to a podiatrist or their general, <coughs> general practitioner, they're not always diagnosed properly, so we're also trying to educate the clinicians as well. Yeah, and, and I know this was the 
Yes. I actually have a couple comments, and one of them kind of uh, bridges onto that. Is I think personally that it would be helpful for oncologists or treating physicians to initiate a physical therapy program prior to even chemo or during the beginning of chemo to assess your deficits, to assess your weaknesses, strengthen what you can, so that you know you can anticipate the balance problems and how do you compensate for those. You know, I went through um, two and a half, three months of physical therapy, but it didn't really improve my endurance because I had too much pain to walk any kind of distance, but it improved my um, awareness of what I can do to compensate. Since I've had the physical therapy, I haven't fallen. And prior to that, in the last in six months, Prior, I had fallen three times, but um, you know, I I know to rely on my eyes. I know not to close my eyes. I know not to do some of those things. Which I mean, it hasn't made it any better, but I haven't had. <coughs> but I, I agree pretty much. I think that had I been stronger, I think um, I would have at least had stronger muscles to handle the weakness. Yeah, and that's another issue. I mean, it's not going to stop the neuropathy, but you're right. I mean, any time that you enter something stronger, it's always, you know, it's always better. And, you know, just um, to speak on behalf of the oncologists and nurses that aren't here, their primary focus is treating the disease. Right. Right. So that's what they're focusing on. And the, unfortunately, as, as Karen says it in the video, um, she's cured of cancer, but now she's left with this more debilitating symptom. So it's just a, it's an education that we have to provide to these uh, oncologists and nurses. So I agree that that's how they've been trained, but they're supposed to treat the patient. Right. Which means the patient needs to understand. Yes. I just have a question regarding numbness versus pain. Okay. Because I just have numbness mm -hmm. in my feet and in my fingers, and and I have a lot of balance issues. And um, does the 
does the numbness often start before pain or is it, it's, it's there are different tracks it's, it's a different part of the of the, the um of your nerve okay. so there's there's parts that the nerve there's fibers that that carry back pain information there's parts that do sensory information it, and in proprioception like where your arm is in space right. they're just different you can have you can have pain um, without numbness you can have numbness without pain you can have some autonomic systems you can be dizzy and and have no pain or no numbness it just and the, and the motor is a different work part for the numbness as, as well as for the pain it, the, the exercises like the balance exercises are to like more okay. fine-tune your balance right. and like your reflexes and you get you more aware of them um, it doesn't make the numbness go away it doesn't fix the nerve but it helps your body um, deal with it, kind of compensate for it. Does that make sense?